Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to our another webinar from the Royal Victorian IE Hospital. Um, I'm Dr. Lena Nito, our GP liaison officer. Um, I'll be moderating this evening and I'll just have a few introductory words um, and some information to give you before our, our main speaker um, starts our main presentation. So um, Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of this land that this webinar is broadcast on. I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge our, our speaker, Dr. Dina El Sayed, who's generously donated her time and expertise to, to provide this presentation. And I'd also like to thank the Northwest Melbourne uh, Primary Health Care Network for partnering with us to provide this GP education event. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go, and I'll just give you a little um, housekeeping demo. Um, if I think all of our all of you guys are on mute, and if you're not on mute, I'll get you to go to your little microphone icon, put yourself on mute. Um, the way I'll get you to ask questions tonight is to type your questions into the questions box. So on the on the right hand side of my screen anyway, there's a go to webinar control panel. You should have something very similar and about one, two, three, four, five, six um, arrows down is questions. If you push on press click on the arrow, it'll open a box and you can type your questions into there. I'll be watching that as we go along uh, or someone's having trouble with audio um, and just so you know, Madeline Leonard from the Northwest Melbourne PHN will be in the background assisting with these sort of troubleshooting things. And so any troubleshooting stuff you need, pop that in the chat box so Madeline can help you um, along the way. She's just getting someone to confirm. Can someone confirm in the chat box that they've got audio? And I see someone's raised their hand. Okay, so I'm looking at all these. I have no, so if someone doesn't have audio, um, it's working. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to keep moving along. So yes, yeah, so feel free to ask questions as we go. Type the questions into the questions box if you have any technical difficulties. Um, pop them in the chat box and Madeline can perhaps help you in the background. So this uh, webinar will be video recorded. When it, that recording becomes available, I will email out to my emailing list. So sign up to that if you're not already on it. Um, it's available to all practitioners, not just medical practitioners. Um, but there will be no CME points for the watching of the video, only for attending this webinar. We've also got other events uh, video recorded there if you want to browse them in your own time. Um, evaluation forms will be emailed to you right at the close of this webinar. So I'll try to remember to remind you at the end, but go to your uh, email inbox at the end of the webinar to fill that in. Um, it's best if you do it ASAP straight away, that way it's fresh in your mind. Otherwise, if you're like me, you'll forget and it won't be very useful or it won't get done. Okay, I'll skim through that. I'm gonna give you a little brief introduction to the IONI Hospital website, referral guidelines, statewide referral criteria and health pathways. There is a health pathway on sudden or recent vision loss and then we'll go to our feature presentation, which it will be the main part of this webinar. Um, we'll have some extra question time at the end, hopefully, and uh, there'll be a slide at the end just giving you details about our next event, which is on the 28th of October on vestibular disorders. You can't register for that just yet, um, but I'll email out when that, that registration become open. Okay, so this is just a little screenshot of the IONI Hospital website, the front page. Um, I guess mainly to note that any COVID-19 related hospital updates will be posted on that page. And also if you go to the, I'll use my mouse, if you, if you go to the Health Professionals tab, 
I can't show you because this is just a screenshot. You click on that for GPs um, and then you get to this front page for GPs um, and there's information there around our current status with um, what's happening with COVID-19, some contact details, um, you know, additional support, emailing GP liaison, obviously that, that's slightly problematic in that I'm only there one day a week, but uh, generally one of my team members, um, usually our patient liaison officer will get back to you in a timely way and, and she's very good at helping people navigate our system if there's blockages or problems. Um, any urgent advice that you need with a for a patient you've got with you, please call the switchboard on that number 992986666 and ask for our E or e, our I or ENT admitting officer, and they can hopefully give you some help over the phone. Um, if you're having problems, uh, then you can email me. But obviously, you won't get um, very urgent advice from me. A bit more about our website. We do have referral guidelines there as well. If you click on that part of the menu, ophthalmology ENT and some cochlear implants guidelines. There's a couple of little primary care guidelines that need updating, but the main ones you'll need to look at are the top two. Um, I'll go back. Uh, they are set in keeping with the statewide referral guidelines. So let me just briefly mention, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but I think it's still a very new concept. The Department of Health um, has introduced statewide referral criteria. The aim is that they provide clear guidance to referring clinicians about which patients will be seen in specialist clinics and what investigations are required to support safe and appropriate triage. Statewide referral criteria shared by all Victorian hospitals, making referral clearer and more equitable. Um, so what that means is um, all, state, all Victorian state hospitals have to triage um, outpatient um, referrals based on the same minimum criteria if they offer that service. The referral criteria are being developed by the Department of Health and Human Services with consultation through clinical review panels. The panel membership comprises health services heads of units or specialists from across Victoria health service, nursing and allied health clinicians, some GPs and GP liaison officers. Currently only six specialties have statewide specialist clinic referral criteria and the criteria only apply to adult specialist clinics. The specialties currently with statewide criteria are ENT, vascular, urology, neurology, gynecology and gastroenterology. So also statewide referral criteria for an additional five specialties, cardiology, endocrinology, rheumatology, ophthalmology and obstetrics are expected to be released throughout this year. Um, but we're not sure when, obviously the, the pandemic has put a bit of a hold on that at the moment. Um, and the other thing to note is that not all conditions under these specialties will have statewide referral criteria. Um, they'll only be developed for common conditions with extended specialist clinic wait times and where there's a strong, there's strong evidence that the condition can be effectively managed in primary care. So what does this mean for referring GPs? Um, from the 1st of February, 2020, selected conditions in neurology, gynae and gastro will be assessed against statewide referral criteria. Um, as well as the ENT vascular and urology. And at some stage, probably this year, or including ophthalmology. What happens if I don't follow them? Um, if referrals don't meet the criteria because the threshold hasn't been met or there's essential information missing, then the referral will be returned to the referrer. Um, you should get a letter from the health service clearly stating why it has been declined. <coughs> Now the new statewide referral criteria um, and related clinical and referral pathways are now available across all Victorian health pathway websites or the equivalent. Um, 
Alternately, you can look at the statewide referral criteria on the DHHS website, but it, it literally just lists what the criteria are. It's much better to go to the health pathways where there are also the related clinical and referral pathways to actually help guide you um, through assessment and management of patients with these conditions. How do I get access? Um, so you need a login to access Health Pathway. So you need to contact your local Primary Health Care Network to request a login. You can visit this particular website and uh, these slides will be included in the handouts that get emailed to you um, to find out who your local PHN is if you're not necessarily within our region, which is the Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Care Network. So this is a, some screenshots now coming up of the Health Pathways Melbourne. Uh, if you're in a different region, then it may look slightly differently, um, but I'm just gonna show you this, hopefully in real time, I'll click through to the website, just because I think um, it's good to start to get, fami to get familiar with it. So you can see this is a, a list of all the ophthalmology conditions that are there on the pathways at the moment. Let's see if my mouse is working. Okay. Um, and so when you log in, you'd go down to under surgical conditions, ophthalmology, and then this list comes up or it comes up here. So I would go to vision loss. So let me see if I can click through to the actual website. Fix my screen a bit. Yes, we're in a webinar, good reminder. Um, so let me go back, open at EMT. And surgical, uh, ophthalmology, click on ophthalmology, it comes back to this screen. So I would go to vision loss for the relevant one for this topic tonight. And under vision loss, we have all of these topics. We're looking mainly at sudden or recent loss of vision. On most of these, there's a little COVID-19 disclaimer at the moment, and you'll just see um, a little explanation of the what the topic is always red flags at the at the top um, and then little uh, boxes that you can open so there's a little bit of background there um, disorders which may cause this and then there's an assessment section about what history to take uh, what examination to perform um, and then the consideration of, of the differential diagnoses. And if I opened one of these boxes, uh, so that actually clicks through to the condition, but there's not a localized one yet for vitreous hemorrhage uh, for retinal detachment. But this one here looks like there's probably information there. So each of these with a plus next to them means there's a little box that you can open up that's got a bit more information about that particular condition. So we keep going down. This is all still under assessment. And then we get to management. And there's always a practice point somewhere in the in the pathway. It's like a, a top tip. Um, so consider sudden, sudden persistent loss of vision. All presentations of sudden persistent loss of vision require prompt ophthalmological advice. If that's a no-brainer. And then it just goes through what you should do with your management and some referral information. And if you click through to some of these, the urgent and routine ophthalmology referral, it comes to a bit more information on referral pathways for this particular region. If you're in a different region, then it would have different information, but it will still have a urgent or routine um, referral information page. There's always a little bit more info, which is often linked to other websites down the bottom and maybe some fact sheets for patients. Okay, let's see if I can get back to my slides. Awesome. So these were just some um, screenshots in case that didn't work. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Dean Al Sayed, who's our our presenter tonight. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. 
Dr. Dina El Sayed. She's a consultant in ophthalmology at the Royal Victorian Army Hospital. She studied medicine and undertook her ophthalmology training in the Faculty of Medicine, Alexandria University in Egypt. She has been a lecturer of ophthalmology at the Alexandria University since 2005. She's also a, a former fellow of the Ocular Motility and Neuro-Ophthalmology uh, Unit at the Ionia Hospital. She has a PhD in Congenital Cataract Management. Um, I was Googling her today. She's also got some, some rooms in Cranbourne, I believe, but she can tell you a little bit more about her, um, the rest of her, her work. Um, and she's very interested in teaching, so she's very kindly uh, offered to teach, uh, uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, okay, Madeline, we can switch to Dina's slides now. Thank you, Thank Lena, you. For, the, for the generous introduction. Um, just give me a minute. So, show my screen. So, I guess this is on right now. My screen. I, I unfortunately I can still see my screen, Dina. Um, just waiting for Madeline to switch yeah. over. Um, Lena, you'll just need to press escape on your screen, um, and that will perfect. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now this is my screen on now. Everybody can see it. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. It's a very important topic to discuss. Um, I, um, I have uh, been in the emergency department of the Ionier Hospital for uh, countless hours and countless shifts, even doing an admitting officer, like being an admitting officer at the Ionier. And um, like the top most important phone calls that I would get for referral is the sudden loss of vision phone call and the uh, trauma phone call, the penetrating eye injury phone call. So when on the other line I hear um, I've got a patient with sudden loss of vision, they, um, I just sit up and I start asking my questions. So I would like to, uh, from the other side, to hear uh, uh, the answers of my questions to be able to um, formulate uh, like a some sort of uh, algorithm of how to tackle this case. So the questions usually that I would start asking is it like how bad is the vision loss? So is it like no perception of light or is it just uh, from 6.6 6 to 6.12? And the other question would be, uh, is it just the one eye or is it both eyes? And then uh, the time frame, was this loss of vision sudden or was it gradual? Because it, it, sudden loss of vision deserves to be seen ASAP. So, but, but gradual, it just can be just referred to a clinic at some other point of time. And it's usually cataract or age-related macular degeneration, something that does not mean need to be tackled right away. Um, and then, um, is it painful or painless? And we'll see in our next slides, what does painful loss of vision mean in comparison to a painless loss of vision? I would ask about the age of the patient and whether the visual loss is central, peripheral or total. So uh, with central, they usually say, I can see a black spot right in front of me or uh, it's just a blob of blackness in the middle of my vision, which probably would be something like a hemorrhage right on the macula, for example. Or they might say, I see your face, but it's very distorted. Or when I look at a line, it's just crooked or wavy. Uh, versus peripheral loss of vision, like somebody would say, um, I can see like a part of my vision lost, and this is a visual field loss, or I would say a blob or a, a kind of a bubble in my vision, like superior temporal or superior or, um, infranasal, whatever, whatever the detachment actually is. And if this is not picked up quickly, it will progress and involve the macula and then the whole vision will be lost. So really it's so important to put these questions in mind when you want to send the patient, especially to an emergency department when um, it's an, a sudden loss of vision. It's not sort of a, 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 a clinic, uh, very cold uh, referral. 
And now, if we start uh, looking at each and every part of my um, questions, why am I asking them? Uh, this is just sort of a, um, a flow chart that would show us everything that we're thinking of, uh, what's going on in our minds when we're looking at a patient with loss of vision. So um, binocular loss of vision, usually the disease, as we all know, wouldn't be um, uh, really in the eye. It's a, it's a brain problem. So usually they would have like a bitemporal hemianopia, a homonymous hemianopia, or even uh, complete blacking out of both eyes for a few minutes and then coming back like TIA or transient vis visual obscurations in, um, in increased intracranial pressure. So this is where we go for scanning the brain and starting to look at neurological assessment. But monocular loss of vision is just a very localized in the eyeball that had the loss of vision disease and they can be um, segregated into basically three categories. Um, the gradual one, we all know this is a cold case. Somebody who's been having that gradual loss of vision and now it's becoming more and more and they want to see an ophthalmologist like from cataracts or from age-related macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy, maybe refractive error. So we're not in a very big rush to see the patient ASAP. On the other hand, the transient and the sudden, both of them are acute emergencies and we have to see them straight as, as, as soon as possible. So when the patient comes and, uh, and says that I have lost vision in this eye completely, like it's hand motion and you can't, like the patient can't even read a chart or count fingers, and it's painless. We know this is a vascular event. Uh, it's either, either a vein occlusion or artery occlusion. But if it's painful uh, and, and it's sudden, then uh, it could be angle closure, as we all know. And we know how a patient comes and he, he's even, he can be even vomiting. He might be having even a stomach ache along with a bursting headache and severe pain in the eye. The eye is very red. They can't open it properly. So the, and the pressure is extremely high. Um, or optic neuritis, so a, uh, a young person coming with a pain on eye movement, which is behind the eye, and um, they just had loss of vision and probably they have optic neuritis with MS causing the problem or any other sort of optic neuritis. Or uveitis, coming with a pink eye and photophobia and watering and the vision is just decreasing and there is no discharge, so it's probably not conjunctivitis. Um, transient uh, loss of vision, like for a few minutes or for a few seconds, for 30 minutes, this is usually an impending problem. And we have to really be careful not to just brush it and just say, oh, it's, it's, it's just a, something that happened and it's, it's all good now. Like the patients usually say, oh, it happened to me like a few times over the past week or two, and then I just didn't make anything out of it and I just forgot about it. And they come with a central artery occlusion central artery occlusion, or they're having GCA and they had a, an optic, uh, uh, ischemic optic neuropathy as a result of GCA. So they initially come with blacking out events and then it just um, it makes itself clear and it becomes a central artery occlusion or um, just an optic neuropathy, an ischemic optic neuropathy. And then I'll ask you, is it is he young or old? Because for example, if a patient um, is having like repetitive attacks of migraines and he's starting to have some auras. It's not like somebody who is 70 years old, never had any um, history of migraines and now he's seeing um, like, like shakes on the on his hemifield or one of his hemifields. This might be an occipital uh, uh, infarct or like a vascular event again. So it's so different how we tackle according to the age. And then I have I've already talked about central versus peripheral. So basically central is um, an, a macular problem, a localized macular problem, like an age-related macular degeneration or a central serosertinopathy or a diabetic retinopathy causing macular edema, uh, while peripheral is either like retinal detachment or a vascular problem too. So when we take history from the patient, um, we, we you, you, need, you need to ask the patient about these little things because it will point out to what exactly what is happening to the patient. 
because there are so many diseases that will cause this sudden loss of vision. So you need to ask about history and um, and the symptoms that are associated. Like, uh, did, he, did he have any trauma? Did he have flashes and floaters? Because oh, I had flashes and floaters, and now a missing part of my vision is equal a retinal detachment. And if his vision is still 6'6", and he's just missing a piece of the, vi of the vision, um, if I wait, then the patient will have a total retinal detachment, and as a result, his, um, uh, his prognosis will be much worse. And then distortion, so macular problem. And the roses, so uh, probably a TIA or, or an impending CRAO, um, pain on motility, optic neuritis, nausea and vomiting, he's got glaucoma probably, um, headache, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, GCA, he might be going into an optic neuropathy, an ischemic optic neuropathy. What do I do with the patient? In your clinic, you will be able to do so many tests that will point out the disease for the patient, for the person receiving your call, and uh, so that we get ourselves ready. And to, if we ask you even to help us out and send some tests or do something before the patient comes, if especially if the time frame at which the patient will arrive to the eye and ear makes a big difference. So I might just ask you if it's an angle closure, for example. Could you please give him some uh, acetazolamide? And the pain of the patient will be relieved by the time he comes to us. It, it'll be much better uh, examining him and managing him instead of having to uh, endure the pain all through the uh, traveling time until he receive, uh, we, he's received by us. So what do I examine? It's everything about the eye. So you need to have a chart and do, his, do the vision so that you can relay this to us, how bad is the vision loss? And you do fields, confrontational fields, test the um, pupils for effort papillary defect, do color vision, do intraocular pressure. If you do have an eye care, it's a very simple, easy machine to use, but it, um, it is very precise with the intraocular pressure measure measurements in, in a very quick, it's very quick. And then test the motility and neurologic assessment as well. Now I'll show you and refresh your memories um, regarding how to test uh, uh, patients. Uh, with all the tests that I've just mentioned. With confrontation uh, testing, uh, you sit one meter away from the patient and uh, the patient is asked, for example, to, if you start with the left eye or the right eye of the patient, you cover the uh, uh, opposite eye and you need to cover the eye which is in front of his covered eye. So if he covers the right, then you cover the left eye. You ask the patient to look at your nose or to look at your eye, but not look at your finger because you're testing his visual field. And you start um, asking him to count your fingers uh, in the four quadrants. And, uh, the and you are the control. So if you see your fingers, he's supposed to see them given that you are normal. And you just say, uh, he does, and if, if he does have a dense, a really dense uh, anopia, hemianopia, for example, it will reveal itself with just a very crude confrontational test. So homonymous hemianopia, bitemporal hemianopia, something of that sort, it will reveal itself very easily on confrontation, even without a computerized to, uh, 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 Humphrey uh, uh, visual field testing. Uh, you're able to elicit uh, the dense uh, uh, visual field defect. So this is quite important to do. Testing the pupils are so important. It's the difference between patient having loss of vision, for example, from vitreous hemorrhage, okay, and the presence of a patient having central artery occlusion. So one of them We'll just need an ophthalmology review and we'll figure it out. And the other one will need the TIA pathway. And it's just about the pupils. The vitreous hemorrhage does not cause a, an abnormality in the pupillary responses. But a central retinal artery occlusion will cause a relative afferent pupillary defect. This is a culprit in, 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 in just examining the patient in your clinic. So just shining the light. So if we look at the first picture, there's no light. The pupils are uh, dilated bilaterally or semi-dilated. It depends on the room, how, your, um, how the room is lit. And then um, you just shine light on one of the eyes. 
So if you shine the light on the normal eye, there will be constriction to the eye that's shone the light on, and this is the direct response. And then the other eye will also be constricting consensually because of the decussation. If you, on the other hand, shine the light on the abnormal eye, which in this position is the right eye, you will see that it's not uh, constricting, it's actually starting to dilate because it's not receiving any light. And as a result, the other normal eye also is dilating. So this is called RAPD. So I know that there's immense, like extensive loss of vision on the right eye, secondary to one of these things like either a central artery occlusion or an arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy, for example. But if the light response is fine and the vision is, is like decreased, and it's not giving me this RAPD that probably might be just a vitreous hemorrhage or maybe a cataract, and this will not change the pupillary responses. And then color vision testing, Ishihara, you can always um, download it from anywhere on your phone and or even have the Ishihara charts uh, just at your desk. Um, the 12 one is just the um, like the slide uh, that um, everybody can get even if they don't have color, any color vision. So it's just like a, a, a test slide or a control slide. And then the other ones, uh, uh, you just say how many the patient has seen out of the number that you showed. So for example, if you showed him uh, 15 slides and he only saw 10, so you say 10 out of 15. Um, generally, uh, loss of color uh, vision is a, uh, is a problem uh, it, it, there would be a problem with the optic nerve. So this is an optic nerve problem, either neuritis or neuropathy. Um, uh, ocular motility testing um, is important, especially in cases of diplopia, or just to finish off your neurological assessment when you're thinking it's optic neuritis or something. And um, you just ask the patient to look uh, in, in an, like to draw an, an H with your finger. So each position of the eye shows you which muscle is not working properly. So um, if you ask the patient to look to, uh, to abduct all the way, this is lateral rectus, or adduct all the way, this is medial rectus. If you ask the patient to um, abduct and look up, then this is superior rectus. Abduct and look down, it's inferior rectus. And if you ask the patient to adduct and look up, it's inferior oblique. And if you want to adduct and look down, it's superior oblique. So if the, any of these positions are not attained or sub, um, like the, the patient is not able to do it well, then probably there is a paresis in this muscle. Um, now we'll take each disease at a, like uh, on its own and we'll start discussing them. So vascular diseases, as we said, these are a group of diseases that would cause acute, painless loss of vision. Um, it, one of them would be amaurosis fugax, and this is a transient loss of vision. Um, it's, um, patients usually describe a curtain going down and then lifting up. After a few minutes, it can take a few minutes, somebody say like 10 minutes and then it went away. Um, and uh, we definitely need to go through the uh, pathway, the TIA pathway, if this happens. The differential diagnosis to this is the transient, transient visual obscurations. These ones are just for seconds, like it blacks out for just a second, especially with eye movements. And it happens in younger people if they do have um, like an increase in intracranial pressure, you know, like ladies having um, IAH, idiopathic, uh, increase, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, so this is different. It's just a, a few seconds and uh, it's more with, with eye movements and it's, it doesn't look like a curtain like amaurosis does or uh, um, amaurosis fugax. And then we have the artery occlusion and the vein occlusion and the, the diabetic retinopathy which can cause a vitreous hemorrhage as a result. So amaurosis is monocular and it's transient for a few minutes, up to 30 minutes, and it looks like a curtain coming down and then lifting up. And um, when, what do we see when we look at the patient? What do we do? We, uh, for examination, we just look at whether the patient has got an embolus or not. If the patient has got an embolus, then we know that this is uh, showers coming maybe from, uh, from his uh, carotid or maybe uh, lower down and from his heart. If we can't see it, then we also put the um, GCA as one of the 
causes that might have caused this amaurosis fugax. And we definitely go ahead and do the CRAO pathway. We all know we need to scan the brain, we need to do ECG, we need to do a Doppler, um, we need to uh, investigate all his bloods and um, talk to neurology. So it's a joint um, uh, a joint problem now for ophthalmology and neurology to tackle together. And it's very important that we do this referral quite quickly or urgently, either to a general uh, ED or to the eye near, that's also fine. But a general ED, if it's closer, it's also okay to do to send to the general ED for investigations. Um, CRAO, um, it can be preceded by a bit of amaurosis or it can happen all of a sudden and it's complete loss of vision. And the culprit of the diagnosis in your situation in office uh, would be the RAPD, it's so important, and the profound loss of vision. For us, what do we see? We might see the embolus in the artery, and we also see the cherry red spot, the very well-known cherry red spot in the first picture. So the macula becomes really red, and all the uh, retina is edematous with ischemia. The um, the macula is red because this is, or it's actually the, the, the fovea, because this is the thinnest part of the retina. So it can still show the redness of the choroid because the infarction happened as a result of the artery occlusion and the retina is infarcted, but not the choroid. So we can see the choroid through the thin part of the fovea and as a result, the cherry red spot. It's very pathognomonic, but we lose this uh, picture after a while. So the retinal edema also subsides and it, lo it, it loses the, uh, the picture of the cherry red spot. Sometimes people are, lucky slash unlucky to have a celiac retinal artery occlusion. So uh, the celiac retinal artery uh, um, supplies a bit of the macula. So some of their uh, central vision is retained and they do not lose vision to the extent of, uh, you know, like uh, NPL or hand motion. They still have got some like 6, 9 or 6, 12. And it's just because, and then this is the second image, you can see that everything is um, just pale. And then there's an area just next to the um, uh, nerve, which is uh, still um, uh, not ischemic. And uh, as a result, patients do not lose vision completely in, in the presence of a retinal artery. And definitely we go ahead and do the CRL pathway or the TIA pathway with these patients as well. Now, a lot of people would ask, what should I do? Do I, is there anything we can do until the patient arrives? And what's the time frame? The window is 90 minutes. And um, there are many methods that people have trialed, but they're not very promising really. Um, like for example, it, it, it all depends on dislodging the clot from where it is. So if in cellular retinal artery occlusion, it's in a main trunk. If we try to dislodge the um, embolus so that it becomes a little bit more distal, so uh, it would allow for perfusion of the macula, so not extensive loss of vision would happen. Maybe if, if it just traveled away, it would only be a little bit of loss of peripheral vision happening. I honestly didn't see any uh, success with any of these um, measures, but they are described and uh, they are trialed in patients arriving before the 90 minutes window. And this would be ocular massage um, for how long? So probably five to 15 seconds and um, uh, like pressure on the globe for five to 15 seconds and then quickly release uh, for five to 15 seconds and then just continue and repeat. Um, uh, and and this will just keep going until um, we, we see if we, and we have a look, is it dislodged, is it not dislodged? Um, the, also the thing that you can do in office would be maybe a bit of Dimox, like acetazolamide, maybe 500 milligrams. What does this do? It reduces the eye pressure. So as a result, it would cause the dislodgement of the um, uh, of the uh, of the blood clot or the embolus. Any any uh, anti glaucoma measure can help, like Simolo or Alpha Gain or Zalatan eye drops. But what you do, what you would have um, in the clinic would be probably a tablet of acetazolamide. And sometimes we resort to AC paracentesis it's also to reduce the pressure of the eye. Um, just with a needle on the slit lamp, we would just um, uh, uh, introduce the needle into the anterior chamber and let the aqueous flow just uh, uh, until the pressure reduces a little bit in hope that the um, that embolus would 
uh, dislodge. And generally, uh, this is, these are like some of the investigations that we don't uh, want to uh, forget about. If it's not symbolic, then uh, we need to include GCA in our investigations. The flow chart on the right is from the iron ear TIA pathway. It is extremely important. It has to be um, like next to us when we're investigating a patient and we just keep ticking what we have done so that we don't forget any of the uh, steps that we should be doing. Excuse me, Dina. Yeah. Leave me here. Um, obviously that, that pathway is too small for us to read and it's not for GPs anyway, but I'm just curious, uh, do they ever, do you ever consider um, thrombolizing these patients if you see them now, soon enough? Uh, at the eye and ear we don't, um, and, but, but I know that uh, at the Alfred they're starting an algorithm for thrombolysis. It's not 100% uh, established yet, uh, but um, for CRAO we don't, we don't do that in the eye and ear hospital. Okay, so it's not standard practice. Not standard practice in, in uh, uh, for CRO, no. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, BRO is pretty much the same like CRO, but this patient had the uh, impetus uh, impacted in one of the branches, so the superior division or inferior division, and he would retain some of his vision and he would lose part of his visual um, field as a result. Whichever part of the retina has been infarcted, he would lose vision in this part. Um, on the other hand, vein occlusions, um, so the risk factors Sorry, we Dana. all know. Yeah. Sorry, Dana, just before you move on, there is a question from our audience about how common the CRAO is and, and how can it be prevented? So, um, is CRAO, I mean, uh, is it the risk factors for the CRAO should be uh, the ones that we should be managing, like the hypertension, the atherosclerosis, diabetes, uh, smoking, uh, these sorts of things. These are the things that we should be treating in order to avoid having, it's just like any other um, cardiovascular disease, yeah. Just any vascular disease as usual. It's just, we, we call the central adrenal artery occlusion a small stroke in the eye. It's just a stroke. Uh, mm. So, I mean, answering this would be just uh, like answering how common would the stroke be and how do we prevent that for ha from happening. Um, mm -hmm. And definitely the TIA and the amaurosis fugax, uh, if, if recognized properly and treated properly, so um, it just putting the patient on um, aspirin and, and uh, statins and um, just managing that as well uh, would reduce the risk for uh, a stroke. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. So um, now back to uh, vein occlusions, it could be central, it could be a uh, uh, branch, just like the artery. Um, it is said that these patients, the artery is the cause, like the atherosclerosis on the artery press, presses on the nerve, and as a result, the nerve would be, uh, sorry, the artery would press on the vein, and as a result, the vein will get engorged and uh, occluded. And usually the, the, uh, these patients wake up from sleep with this. So they, uh, they last, last night I was fine. And this morning I woke up and it's all fuzzy. I can't see a thing. Um, they, they might have an afropipary defect if it's extensive and ischemic, or they might not have it. Um, and they are liable to glaucoma. So we are the people who are be who will be um, looking after them for a long time. They do have macular edema and also glaucoma as a result of vein occlusion. Um, the uh, it's not as acute and it's not as um, uh, emergent as the CRAO. So, but but you don't know, like when you're at the clinic and you didn't look at his fundus, you're not sure what's going on. So just waking up from sleep and uh, having loss of vision, whether he has the epipipary defect or not, you just need to send the patient anyways, because it does cause loss of vision. Um, it could be from a little as six, nine to profound as hand motions. So it's very, very variable how the presentation in vein occlusion would be, depending on the amount of occlusion that they have. Retinal detachments. Now, 
I, I have noticed that a lot of my patients, a lot of patients that are sent to the uh, emergency departments with flashes and floaters, um, they have the impression that they already have uh, a detachment, which is not true. A lot of them, like the biggest percent of them, would only have a posterior vitreous detachment. So we all know that the, um, the vitreous is a gel that liquefies with time. Uh, people who are older become, uh, the, their gel becomes liquidy and it starts collapsing. And while it's collapsing, it would pull on the retina because it's got these attachments to the retina. And the retina being stimulated, it would just give the impression of flashes of light. Um, the floaters are condensations in the vitreous. When they get detached from the retina, these areas are more condensed, so you can see them. Or they can rip a part of the, like one of the blood vessels, and nick it, and then as a result, some bleeding, and they can see showers of um, uh, uh, floaters in their vision. So uh, basically, I can't say that any person who has flashes and floaters would be having a retinal detachment, but he they are at a risk of retinal detachment. So when I talk to the patient and I hear that they have flashes and floater, I tell them, you need to be seen today or tomorrow at a maximum, so that we would rule out the presence of a tear, because the presence of a tear needs lasering to prevent you from having detachment. And especially if they did have trauma or myopia, or they have a history of retinal detachment, or they had an ocular surgery. These patients, if they have flashes and floaters, they need to be seen ASAP. But really, um, uh, just uh, the posterior vitreous detachment is very common. And uh, when it happens acutely, patients need to be seen as well. Um, now, I can also advocate for a, an, an ophthalmoscope in your clinic. If you do have it, it's very handy. Why? Because if you compare both eyes, if the, um, if the patient is having a vitreous hemorrhage, it will be very black and dull on one eye, and it would be clear and normal, like orangey color on the pupil of the other eye. If you do have it, it's good. If you don't have it, it's fine. Just the complaint, obviously, denotes either like a posterior vitreous detachment, which would be a um, just a red flag to a uh, possibly retinal detachment. How do I say it's a retinal detachment actually with just the history? So when the patient says, I had some flashes and floaters previously, like a few days ago, and now I can see a blob in my vision, like peripheral blob, or it's just increasing in size and now I cannot see a thing. So when they start seeing a blob, this is definitely a detachment happening, okay? Especially if they had flashes and floaters previously and they need to be sent as soon as possible because they are a surgical problem and they need to be tackled straight away. Now, looking at macular pathology, um, this is uh, probably quite uh, um, chronic and gradual. Um, it's central in origin and the patient would be either, as I said before, having a macular degeneration or a central serous retinopathy or a, even a macular hole. And it's just long, it's a long standing condition. It doesn't, like the patient doesn't say, I was six, six yesterday and this morning I cannot see the central part of my vision. This is really rare, except if there's some sort of a bleed that happens, like Valsalva retinopathy, which is not very common. Uh, so usually the macular pathology is a, um, a gradually evolu evolving uh, problem and you can, the evolving problem, and you can send to a clinic. Um, with the optic nerve, and this is when, where, where we talk about RAPD. Just as I told you, RAPD, then the first two things that are, should be popping in your mind would be either a CRAO or an optic neuropathy or an optic neuritis, optic nerve disease in general. So optic neuropathy um, can be so many things. Um, if it's acute, then it's probably uh, a GCA problem in an elderly person, or uh, non-arthritic, like infarction ischemic of the ischemia of the optic nerve secondary to uh, like diabetes, hypertension. So just a, an ischemic event as well on the, on the optic nerve. Or it could be an inflammatory problem in a younger patient like optic neuritis. 
But these are not the only things that could happen to the optic nerve. It could be compressive by a tumor, and this would be a bit gradual rather than acute. And trauma, you would have history of trauma. Infiltrative, you would his have history of, um, I don't know, leukemia or lymphoma, maybe. Uh, and um, papilledema uh, with IAH is, uh, is sort of a problem that gives you this transient visual obscuration. Um, and you've got, you, you, it's usually in females, and usually they're overweight, and usually they're younger. Um, so if we want to talk about uh, ischemic optic neuropathy to start with, so there are two main types. The profound one, the bad one, is the arthritic one, the GCA one. This is the one that we all are afraid of in a patient who has scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, pain in the neck, pain in the shoulder, loss of weight. Um, and then they start having amaurosis. So it starts flickering in the beginning, just blacking out every now and then. And then they have severe loss of vision afterwards. So this is the GCA um, uh, spectrum. The other one, usually uh, the non-arthritic one, uh, as a result of the vascular risk factor, as I just said, and these patients um, do not have such profound loss of vision. And usually they lose sort of part of the vision, like part of the visual field, rather than having profound, complete loss of vision, like in arthritic type, uh, GCA type. Nonetheless, the uh, pupillary responses are so important. And both of them need to be seen so that we would differentiate between whichever type it is. Uh, GCA can happen in a 60 year old and, uh, and non-arthritic can also happen in a 60 year old. So what I'm saying is we need to see the difference uh, and uh, so that we can guide ourselves to the management of the patient. And, and this is quite acute and this definitely needs a referral straight away. Um, optic neuritis, the very classic story, is a um, 20 year old female, loss of vision on one eye, loss of color vision, afferent pupillary defect, pain on eye movement, classic for optic neuritis. There are now so many types of optic neuritis evolving in the same age group and a bit older, which is atypical. It's uh, like the neuro neuromyelitis optica type and the MOG related type. Um, there are also the infective, but what I, what I, what's common between all of these is the loss of vision and profound loss of color vision and the obvious afferent pupillary defect. It's the culprit, afferent pupillary defect in these cases. And these ones, they need to be sent also ASAP. We do an MRI for them just to see if they have a, um, a MS along with the optic neuritis. And we admit them for IV methylpred for three days and then followed by oral uh, for 11 days. And, um, and then maybe refer to neurology if they, if they have repetitive attacks so that we, uh, they can be on something for their MS if they do have MS. Um, ankle closure, also a classic story. Patient coming, usually um, these patients are hyperopic. So the mechanism of this is that the hyperopic eye, which which we we call it uh, slang, is is slang. The slang word for it is I'm far sighted. I can see better for distance, but not for near. And I'm not talking about presbyopia. They have this all their lives. Um, so these eyes are small. Everything inside the eye is very crowded and everything is so close to each other. The, uh, if we look at the uh, picture uh, inferior to the, uh, I mean, the uh, demonstration in, in uh, lower down in the slide, um, it is the angle of the anterior chamber, which is formed by the cornea, the, the grayish uh, structure, the cornea, and the iris, which is the reddish structure. And this is an open angle, as you can see on the left hand side, nothing is uh, touching each other so that much. On the right hand side, this is a crowded angle, this is a closed angle. Um, you can see how the iris is uh, uh, bowing upwards. Uh, it's all very crowded, uh, there is no space. And this angle is where the um, aqueous is uh, uh, drained. So if it's not drained properly, it would just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and as a result, the pressure would just build up higher and higher and higher. And the patient would 
definitely go into an acute angle closure and severe pain, as I told you, um, with headache. And, and they say that my eyes, or that my eye will be exploding. My eye will, will, will feels like it's it's going to be exploding. Um, the precipitating factors. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've written some on my slide, but it's more of the, the, think about it. What causes mid dilation of the pupil? At the mid dilated position of the pupil, this is where it is most uh um most crowded if you might say especially like twilight like w w when the light is not not that uh, uh intense and not very dark so in the middle they sometimes have it after ha having after going to the cinemas and just as they go in or go out um they get the attack and the, and when you look at the patient the, the cornea is very cloudy why is that the accumulation of the aqueous is too high to the extent that it seeps to the stroma and the cornea instead of being or or clear and beautiful it will become smoky so you will actually see the cornea turning into whitish instead of being clear um and the pupil just stays in this position the mid dilation it's not very dilated it's not very constricted it's just in the mid dilation and the eye is very red and angry, and the pressure is very high. Now, what if you don't have a pressure measure, measuring uh, device? You, even with your finger, just pressing just a tiny bit like this and comparing both eyes, you will feel a solid, rock hard eye instead of being um, softish and you're able to um, just indent a little bit the eye. Well, how do we do that? How do we treat that? Now, if I know that this is an angle closure and you said, you, Sorry, you, you Dana, tell me on the phone, it looks like it. Yeah. Dana, we've got yes. uh, just a few minutes left. So I'm not sure how many slides you have left. I am nearly done. Okay, awesome. No, that's okay. Keep going. Yeah. Um, this is the last, the last of the uh, presentation, actually, this slide. Um, so what do we do with these patients? Um, now, medically, and from the office, even if you are very suspecting, very much suspecting angle closure, um, just a little bit of Diamox can, can reduce the pressure for the patient. Uh, there are other drops like Alphagan, which is an alpha agonist, or a beta blocker like Timolol. Pilocarpine, just the pilocarpine um, just abolishes this mid dilation. It makes it go into into constriction, so that it will uh, open the angle for the patient to be able to drain his own aqueous. And what do we do? We do a um, laser for these patients. It's called laser peripheral iridotomy, which um, which sort of uh, makes it easier for the aqueous to seep to the anterior chamber angle to be drained, so the pressure also would uh, reduce. And definitely do not forget the other eye because they're a replica of each other probably like they, they would the, the other eye would be at risk of uh, angle closure as well if not managed and looked after by us yeah and um, so generally um, uh, what, what I want to shed light on is CRO and how we would um, recognize that from the afferent papillary defect versus uh, like a vitreous hemorrhage, which is really not that of big of an issue. It's an ophthalmologic problem rather than a neurological problem. And the GCA, to recognize the GCA and to recognize the amaurosis and the TIA um, as a uh, impending problem happening to the patient. And uh, with regards to reading the Kensky, um, Kensky uh, clinical ophthalmology book is the best um, and the simplest and the most precise picture with pictures book for ophthalmology is so simple and easy to read. If you would like to have it in your library, just to look up things if you want, it's very, very simple and easy to um, uh, read. That's that's it for today and thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Dina. Um, I've, I've missed a couple of questions, so we'll quickly go to that. Um, yes. I guess, firstly, one asks, what is GCA? So that's giant cell arteritis, or what we might refer to as temporal arteritis. Yeah. Um, and um, another question, um, is it both flashes and floaters, rather than just floaters alone? Um, flashes are, uh, to us, are more uh serious than floaters but i don't mean i don't mean that floaters are not serious 
But yeah. flashes mean that there is pulling on the retina. So there's traction yeah. and there's yeah. and the possibility of a tear. Floaters uh, can be just the condensation after everything has happened. And if they're long standing, like if the patient tells you, I've got floaters and these has been there for, for years, there's no issue about that. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. has got floaters in their eyes. But if yeah. new, if flashes, uh, sorry, if floaters are new, this needs to be seen. If flashes and floaters, this raises the um, myth, the, the thought of fraction of the retina and as a result, a tear maybe. Yes. And the uh, the last question we've got there is why antihistamines would precipitate a, acute angle closure glaucoma? Um, why antihistamines? Uh, why antihistamines? I am not very sure. I do not want to answer this question in a wrong way, but some of them are associated with it. Okay, we'll we'll have to look into that and get I'll back to that. Up and maybe send it if we can send it over the email. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that would be fine. All right, so uh, I might just finish up. If there's any other questions, uh, type them in now quickly um, and we can come back to them at the end. Madeline, if I could just have my last couple of slides. Thank you. So, show my screen. Let me get my. Okay, show my screen. I don't know if you can see all these boxes on my screen, so let me just um, try and move them. Confirming so, it's all um, good. Oh, great. Okay. Look, thank you, um, Dr. Din El Sayed, for that fabulous presentation. And thanks also to Madeline Leonard from the Northwest Melbourne PHN uh, for your support in bringing this webinar. Um, and also for, for, to the PHN for really your ongoing support with all of our education program. Um, we, Madeline will be emailing you, or she may have just emailed you um, some evaluation forms. So please check that. Uh, put in your RACGP, QI and CPD number and name if you'd like points for this session. Uh, and she will also email attendance certificates. Um, if you're not already on my emailing list, then just drop me an email at gpliaison at ironia.org.au. And that way you'll find out when videos get posted on our web page and when we've got um, uh, further events coming up. Um, we'll also send out some PDF handouts of both of our presentations um, tonight and hopefully we might have an answer to the antihistamines. And um, I will email when the video recording is available. Um, as a, and save the date, our next GP education webinar is going to be on Tuesday the 28th of October. We're going to be starting a little bit earlier because we've got a slightly longer webinar with a slightly bigger program. Um, it will be on an introduction to vestibular disorders starting at 6.30pm. Dr David Smulovic, our um, neuro-otologist, he has presented for us at least two times before I think and I think his video recording of his last, the last time he did it is still probably one of our most popular videos that people go to on our website. So this is definitely an area that we all struggle with. I still struggle with this area. And I, as I say, I've, I've heard him present at least twice before. Um, we've also got, he's invited uh, one of our audiologists, Nicola Baker and um, our vestibular physiotherapist, Arimbi Winoto to speak as well. So they'll um, both be presenting, so it will be quite informative. As I say, registrations aren't open yet. Um, that probably will happen within a few weeks. Um, so I'll be sending out an email when registrations are open for that. Uh, I think that's all I really have to say. Thank you so much to everyone for attending. I will just, uh, and to Dina and to Madeline, I will just, check if there's any further questions. I'm not seeing any other questions there, but Dina and I might hold on the line for another couple of minutes. Uh, thank you everyone for your attendance. Um, and I'll email when this video recording has become posted to the Iron Ear Hospital GP education page. Dina, did you have any final comments or? 
I um, I hope that this talk would um, shed some light and um, would be of benefit to everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to uh, discuss this topic. Oh, thank you so much. You're delightful. Um, and it's yeah, it's a very important topic. So we really appreciate that. Um, and obviously, you know, in real time, um, we can look in and use the health pathways to also assist us and to know when to refer. Yeah, I definitely recommend that as well. I have looked at them and they, um, as I told you, Lena, they're kind of a foolproof. They're very, very good. They um, they tackle everything and uh, tell you what to do. And you can just put it on the side and have a look while you're looking at your patient even. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, I, I think on that note, we might um, sign off. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Thank Dina. Thank, Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. Okay.